This is Duke University. Doesn't seem that interesting now, but 
uh, back 10 years ago was actually like, somewhat original at least. So um, that was the original concept of my very first company. I drew this for them. And I'm a designer. I became a designer eventually and now have a design firm. This was my very first you know, website concept. And it's uh, and I didn't know how to use any tools at that time. I just drew it on a sketch pad for them. <laughs> And it's optimized for 640 by 480. Netscape <laughs> logo. <laughs> so um, basically, we kind of we spent so much time when we were doing Easy Central, refining the business plan, researching, doing all the research, trying to um, figure out how we were different from any other idea that had been out there. And we ended up writing a really great business plan, but we never really had the courage to go out and try to start the business or get venture funding. Then spring of 2000 came and the internet market kind of crumbled. So um, it was time for me to graduate. So basically I um, graduated college and Brooks gave me um, Dreamweaver and Fireworks, which are some web development programs. I didn't have any kind of background in technology. And I went to work for a startup. Um, probably a lot of the reason I got the job was because of my experience at Easy Central understanding a little bit about the space. So I went to work for started at two people and kind of became their first full-time employee. Um, and part of my job at the startup was to find a vendor to do um, do the company website. So I looked around and found somebody that we paid, I think, five or six thousand dollars, which to me, and my job was to kind of learn how to update the site after we had um, you know, worked with this vendor. And so I saw what they did and I was like, I could do that, five or six thousand dollars. I could live for three to six months on that. <laughs> I really should start a website company. So I kind of learned how to update our company website and learned a little bit of HTML programming and so forth. And um, this company, Full7, did email software and we kind of did designs in, in people's email that they could have as a corporate signature. And so I learned some of the design programs and one of our clients was like, hey, you know, you did a good job in the email you do website updates, you know, how much do you charge? I said, well, 50 bucks an hour, and start to do some freelance website development work. And that was kind of the very beginning of when we um, the seeds for a starting company. And at, at the same time, while he was doing that, I was um, a sophomore in college, maybe a junior, and was taking a, web, a graphic design elective. And we had started to talk about doing a company ourselves together. Uh, because when he was doing Easy Central, I never got to see him, and I was just smoking around the house while he and his friends did all this, all, all this entrepreneurial uh, activity, and I would just wait for him to finish. I thought, I'm never going to see this guy again if I don't join him in his entrepreneurial uh, ventures. And so we talked about, you know, get, doing something together, and so um, he had n now had Dreamweaver and Fireworks and was starting to learn how to do things. And uh, my final project for my uh, graphic design course was something that I could, you know, was up, up in the air and do anything I wanted. And so I did a homepage for my mom's um, side venture. She was an orthodontist and was trying to do this training um, company. And so I decided that would kill two birds with one stone. I could do this as for my final and also give it to my mom as her Christmas present. And so. Um, so there, let's see. So there it is. This was the design, um, and um, she, of course, she's. This is just her personality, but she loved it, and she said, "You've got to start a company. You are amazing. I'm going to send you so much business, you'll be able to handle it." And of course, I believed her. That didn't actually work out, but <laughs> we ended up. We it gave us a little bit of momentum to go ahead and get the paperwork um, filed and got the company uh, set up and we you know brainstormed a bunch of names. What was the other one? Jive, Jive Genius. We're trying to decide whether it was going to be novel projects for Jive Genius with novel projects. Um, so we were, I was sort of doing this at the same time but everything was kind of coming together for us to you know uh, eventually make the big sh shift to uh, doing this full time. Um, so then basically in 2002 we were living in that apartment and um, I was also working on a website for my dad's company, I actually designed that logo. And um, unexpectedly in 2001, my dad actually passed away. He was a professor and um, also had a small uh, pharmacy marketing research business called Rapidetta. 
So I finally decided to make the leap at that point and left my job to try to see if I could take over his market research company and also get our uh, website development company off the ground. Um, so basically, when we got started, we were just getting occasional referrals from family and friends, doing websites, whatever we could get, and just doing the best job we possibly could, maybe making a couple thousand dollars a month. And Brooks was still in college, I think she was like a junior. I was about a year out of college at that point. And, um, Two of the guys that we actually lived with in the Norwood house eventually joined on to the company. They were laid one, off. One on the right was... One on the right was Dan, and he actually joined on um, in November, I think, of 2001, before Brooks had even graduated college. She graduated a semester early, and um, she was already working full-time on the company by the time while well, she was a senior in college, and then Rob joined on in the spring. We're now up to four people, and we didn't really have enough money to guarantee them a salary, so we just kind of decided to split all the revenues that came into the company equally and divide the equity in the company equally, which was something we would later regret. But, uh. Pretty quickly, we regretted that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So those guys are great. They're really great people and good friends. Um, but pretty quickly after we brought them on, it was really it, that we had a lot of problems with partnership. And that's sort of one of the points that I really want to make is about partnership, that when you're starting something up, you really have very few options. You don't have any money. You can't pay anyone's salary. You need really great talent, especially when you're that young, to make a go of it. You have you really have no choice to, but to have a, a partner. But the, the problem is, when we brought those guys on, there were four of us. We split everything equally. We thought of it as like a group project where, you know, we're just going to, you know, be creative. We're going to work together. We're going to work late nights. We're going to have a great time. And we're going to, you know, be successful together. And we split everything perfectly e evenly. And there was no one that was in charge. No one was a leader. There was no hierarchy in our organization. We, we assumed that we would all, all uh, contribute equally. Um, the problem was that we really didn't. Um, one of the guys had a girlfriend, and she really didn't want him to work late, so he wouldn't. And the other, the other guy had a whole bunch of extracurricular activities, and Jess and I would work late, work a lot more, and we were also bringing most of the business. And I think our, our friendship wasn't really, it, it's, it's really not compatible to working with friends. It's, I think it's similar to, you know, if you're a good friend, and they want you to loan them $1,000, then that turns into a business relationship. And if they cannot pay you back that $1,000, it becomes a problem. You know, in any relationship, it's, it's a problem when there's some sort of value that, that gets mixed into that. And that's what happens with partnerships, is that you, there are, there, it becomes a very serious business relationship. And you cannot mix that's the social relationships with the business relationships. And the best way to do that, if you do have a partnership, is there has to be a leader. Someone has to have more equity than someone else. Someone needs to be the CEO. You have to have the ability to lay people off, to fire people, to have someone have more power than other people. Otherwise, and it, it's, that's tough when you're starting and there's no value in the company and you have a great relationship and you, you trust each other. It's not a good thing unless you have, you have to make those decisions really early in the relationship. Otherwise, when you're successful, it, it will start to fail. And that's, that's really part of the problem is we, now projects started to become successful. We started getting bigger and bigger projects, and we, um, we got AOL as, our, as a client. Jess's sister was working for AOL, and it ha happened that she was looking for, she worked for the um, online marketing group, and she was looking for some small agencies to feed her, her group some creative. So it was a great fit. And she hired, um, and so since I was the creative person and Jess and the partners were all developers, she was working exclusively with me. And so Jess got the lead, I did all the work, and we were driving all of the value up from AOL. And AOL was very quickly 80% of our revenue. And these other guys just, you know, they weren't really a part of it. They were just really didn't. They were doing a lot of other things. They weren't really as committed as we were, and and things and also because we were dating and we were seen as a a, a unit, and they were good friends. They both came from the same company. They were sort of seen as a unit, 
it made it very difficult for us to have good collaboration and communication. And they would assume that we were scheming, you know, it's just things got bad really fast. And then we couldn't grow the company, even though we had a lot, it was the problem is we had a lot of money in the bank and we were successful. And it was, as soon as we had value, it was very tough. It, it made it a lot harder. And that's kind of counterintuitive. Um, but I think as entrepreneurs, you should expect to be successful, that you should plan for success and expect to have that vision that you are going to be successful at whatever you do. Otherwise, it's not worth doing. And when you are successful, you want to make sure that you are set up correctly to be successful. So Novel Projects is kind of like a 1.0 attempt at getting our entrepreneurship going. And it did get things going. We got some revenue. Uh, we got some success. We had clients and so forth. And but we realized we made some mistake with, with partnership things. We kind of just went by the seat of our pants and learned as we went. Uh, it was one time in our projects where we moved the entire company down to Florida for a, for a month just because we thought it would be fun to do. And we would, you know, come in late, stay late, and learn a lot the hard way and over time understand why people do business a certain way. So it was a, it was a fun experience and it was a great learning experience, but ultimately um, we decided we had to split the company up into pieces in order to be able to grow and keep things going. So, yeah, we, in the end of 2003, Novel Projects is actually still around. You can go to their website, they've got a few people. But we split the company into three, the existing website development, the advertising side to handle the AOL business, and then a product side, which I was running. And these are, <coughs> excuse me, these are the original kind of classic logos when we split the company up. The choice was that because AOL was such a big piece of our business and because it was my piece of the business, I really wanted to take all that revenue and reinvestment and become, and we thought online marketing is making a lot of money. Let's throw more people and resources and get a lot more out of that relationship. And um, Jess and the partners, they really wanted to take all of that and, re and re reinvest it and fund a product. Um, and. And it, I wasn't on, that was really the problem, is that do we go with services or do we go with the product? The product is much more risky. And now we have the money to fund it, but it's, we could lose it all. And that would feel really bad. Um, or we can continue to focus on services and continue to grow that and create even more. And maybe eventually uh, fund a product. And we couldn't agree. And so we just finagled a negotiation. And the three guys started, went with Jerfile, and started to build something, try to fund it on their own. And then um, Brooksville, and I founded Brooksville Interactive to focus on the, on the services. Actually what happened is one of the partners stayed with Novel Projects, and then myself and one other went into Sharefile. About a week after we split the three companies, the one that had come with me into my company just decided to leave. He decided he wanted to do something else. And, um, and then the one partner who ran Novel Projects for a couple of years eventually left and found a replacement. Is actually another dude grad who currently runs the website. So that brings us to Brooks and Jess 2.0. Uh, we're not going to spend as much time on this because I don't think it's quite relevant to you guys yet, but we'll kind of go through some of the key key touch points within the development of our companies. So this is my current logo with Brooks Interactive. We are both operating from this building in downtown Raleigh on um, 510 Glenwood. And uh, so I'll talk about a few things. So Brooksville Interactive, the name. Uh, the reason I named it Brooksville Interactive is, uh, is I was 23 years old and just kind of a designer, very young, and I didn't have very much confidence in myself. I thought, I don't really know anything. I've just got this lucky break with AOL. I'm not, I'm not a trained designer. I've taken one graphic design class, which isn't even web design. I really know nothing. And why would I name something after myself when I have no value to add. And just suggested that I name it after myself. And at first I just thought, that's really arrogant. And I just, people are going to, you know, they're not going to understand why I did that. But when I thought about it, I thought that in kind of planning for success, I thought that if I named it after myself, and even if I don't really feel that I deserve it, people that I interact with will assume that I have a lot more confidence than I do. Because only someone who's confident would name a company after themselves. And so they would treat me like I deserve it. And then because they would treat me that way, I would start to feel like I deserve it. And I would start to fulfill the, uh, you know, the, 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 the shoes that those set, set up for me. And, and I think that worked. I think that it 
I, it really did work that way. That he, when I started to say, I'm with Brooks Bell Interactive, I'm the CEO, and it just kind of is a self-fulfilling thing where you start to feel much more <coughs> So that's kind of an interesting story, and I think that it really is applicable, especially for women who generally do not feel a natural level of confidence. AOL, well, we talked about this a little bit. That is the first pop-up that I signed. That thing is ugly, very <laughs> ugly. Uh, but it beat the control, and uh, and AOL was my only client for a while. Uh, at first, I was simply around to make the most of AOL. I had a couple other clients, like Nickelodeon and Monster, for a while, but really AOL is still 80% of my company for a few years. And I hired a bunch of people just to work for me to make the most of AOL. We had no vision. Uh, because of our original planning, we had a five-year exit plan. And so I was planning to grow that thing and sell it and make a bunch of money. Um, and and my, value, my culture at my company was not that great. People didn't really like working for me. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I really didn't. I mean, I was a nice person, but they were working for me, and they were helping me make a lot of money. And that doesn't feel good. No one wants to work for someone else to make someone else a lot of money. And they want to work for a vision, and, a, and a, uh, they want to work for something more than just another person. And I, I'm sure Brooks Wallen Drive hurt that, but... Um, I think that it, our culture was very transactional, where we were just sit, sitting there waiting for AOL to make calls, give us another project, we do it, we send in the bill, and wait again. There was nothing else outside of that. There was no like deep values. And uh, and I did a and then I did a uh, a retreat, and I defined my core values, which at the time seemed kind of irrelevant, but after I did it, it seemed very relevant. And the five values that I defined were really my values as a person. One is expertise, there's happiness, curiosity, authenticity, and accountability. Those are the five core values. And then from that point forward, I went through and thought about what are all my employees? Do they share those core values? And I also decided because expertise is one of my core values, I, that means I really want to do what I'm doing and get really good at it for the rest of my life, which is online marketing. And then if I sell this company, then I'm not going to be able to do anything else because I would become an expert in this one thing. And uh, and so I decided I'm not going to sell it. I'm not building this to sell. I'm building it to build it. And that Justin can go sell his company and I'm going to be in this forever. And then I'm only going to hire people that have the same core values as me. And as soon as that happened, the whole company shifted. It is, was a critical moment in our growth as a company. And it, took, it was an organic process. I wasn't ready to find core values until the time that I did. But as soon as I did, it made a big difference. <clears throat> now I hire core values rather than other skills. So in terms of the share file story, I just kind of quick update of how, we, how I got started. Really, when we split into three companies, um, I felt like I kind of got the short end of the stick. We had clients in novel projects. We had clients in first dollar active AOL, which was generating a lot of revenue. And my part of the company that I took over was really nothing. It was just a, we didn't have any revenue. It was just kind of the idea to do products. And there were, I was a soft, I'm a soft, I learned to do software development. And um, I just kind of bootstrapped the company and uh, had a few product ideas I was toying around with. And a lot of people advised me not to do ShareFile. And I don't think I really, really fully explain what ShareFile is. But it's a password protected area where you can give clients a username and password set up folders and exchange business files. So kind of like a client login area for your website. And I talked to a lot of companies and they said, yeah, I could use that. I've got clients, I've got big files that are too big to email and so forth. And so I went ahead and, and launched it, started up really with no funding, just uh, a Google AdWords paid search account. And the first month, I think I spent 500 or $1,000 and got 20 free trials and four of those turned into paid accounts. Now this month we're probably going to get about 2,000 trials, and probably about um, seven or 800 of those are going to turn into paid accounts. You get an idea. But uh, I was just a one-man operation. I was actually spending a lot of time working at the VP of Technology and Prince's company, just spending a couple hours a day in share files. So it was really like starting over. And um, the first person I hired really was we were Brooks and I were getting married. This was back in two, summer 2006. And the guy who was a younger brother of the guy in my freshman dorm was looking for a job. And literally, I was the customer support department that 
tech department, the sales department, and everything. And so I couldn't be away for two weeks because there'd be no one there to answer the phones or if the server went down, there'd be no one, no one there to fix it. So I hired one guy just to get started with that. And from there, we just have grown organically and um, reinvesting in growth and advertising. We have about 20 people now. And we spend, uh, we'll spend over a million dollars a year, or this year, on our advertising efforts on, through Google. And so we can spend under to 150000 a month on that now. So it's just been a complete bootstrapped operation. Um, done without any funding, just grown organically. So here are some things that we've, uh, we've learned. So it was a lot of work, and I don't want to make you feel like you can just go and be an entrepreneur and, and have a great social life at the same time. You really can't. It's a lot of work, but it's really not miserable. It's really, when you love it and you're really invested, it doesn't feel like work. It's really what, every time I interview someone, I say, I want to be challenged, I want to be engaged, I want to be working on something for a greater good, and that's really what it's like to be the owner, that you are challenged, you're working for something that you believe in, something that you're passionate about, and that you really have much larger capacity for that, that work. It's useful to, um, it, that's why it's useful to start when you're younger, before you've developed a lot of commitments that, that make it much diff more difficult to put in the hours and, and commitment that, that it will take. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, originally, uh, my plan when I uh, started Novel Projects was I want to retire by age 30 and sell my company. And I'm 31 now, so I haven't retired. And it just took me a lot longer, it's taken me a lot longer to grow my company than I thought. And so originally, especially back in 99 when I was in college, a lot of people were starting a company and then IPOing or exiting within 12 months. And now I'm in, coming up on my 10 year reunion in the spring, so I've been at it for really almost nine years now. And it takes a long time. Uh, it's something you should definitely think about as a career rather than just starting a company and selling it. And something. And when you think about potential partners, think about, you know, I might be doing this business until I'm 40 or 50 years old, and are these partners still going to be people I can envision being around for that long? So um, it's going to take, it takes longer, at least in, in my experience. And we know a bunch of other entrepreneurs as well uh, for our, for our, for our Duke and They've been at it a long time. Sometimes you can sell a company. I sold I sold one company, but uh, you know it's it's and Novel Projects was a kind of a previous company that was sold. But it takes it's definitely a process and it's definitely a career choice, not just a one time thing to do for a year or two. Um, another big thing is customer service. I think that that's if you want to start a company. This was actually we found this. This is our first website for novel projects, and uh, reading a copy, it's, it's actually pretty good. But um, we really have the philosophy that if you'll pay us $75 an hour, we'll do anything for you. We'll do your laundry for $75 an hour. It's all about service. We'll do whatever the customer wants. If you'll pay us, we're, we're just relentless about service. I like that it says, in addition to fashioning web pages, we can research your market, write content, set up eight email accounts, obtain with web posting, do custom programming, create logos, and color schemes, help with email marketing, and even dog sit. We're not, we're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes it to help your company advance in business goals using electronic media. I think that was part of what it was for us. We, were, we knew we were underqualified to do website development, but we were able to make up for that with kind of our being smart, having a can-do attitude, and just thinking we're going to just outwork the other people who they might be uh, looking for a website project with, and we would just, any lead we got for a proposal, we actually had one guy who we did a bunch of proposals for, and he's a Duke graduate as well, um, basically tell us in the meeting, please stop working. We, we had get done so, so much upfront work in the proposal process, auditing his whole website, giving him comments on every page of some 100-page website, he said, um, just please don't do anything else. We feel horrible. We'll give you the job. Just please stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really, the, we got, in our, especially in our first couple of years while we were trying to make it, it was not about making profit on the projects at all. It was absolutely about making sure the customer was really, really happy. And that's how we were able to get business. We started with a couple of leads from our friends and family. We never did any advertising, but we were able to be successful just by 
really just absolutely focusing on making sure everybody was thrilled with what we did. The, the reason that this is so important is because it's very important when you're starting your company, but it's also important even once you have a mature company. For my my and it doesn't matter where your company is, it's important because with my company I have I have big clients and they don't you know the creative we give them is important, the strategy and the results they're all important, but the most important thing is our client service that we call them back, we email them back quickly, we get the stuff done on time, that we are friendly, that they like working with us. That is absolutely the reason that they keep coming back. It's not all the other stuff. I mean, that other stuff is just table stakes. And it's the customer service that is always what, what makes you, uh, what separates you from your competition. And same thing with ShareFile, that he has a product company, has 7,500 customers. And he has an account manager for every, for every 1,500 of them that answers the phone. I mean, customer service is his number one priority. Their, his user experience is bar none. And that is, that is still the reason that we're successful. And I believe it's relevant to every business out there. All right, so that's kind of the end of our background history. And now we want to get into the advice portion of the, of the presentation. <laughs> so you need to start your business right now, as in like this semester. And there's no better time than to start a challenge to go ahead and get going on this if you haven't already. So why is that? Why, are we, why do we feel so strongly that right now is the best time in your life to do this? First of all, you have a lot more time than you will ever have again. <laughs> Once you graduate, you're going to have a full-time job, nine hours of work, and it's you have way too much time right now. <laughs> Additional, you're probably more you're poorer than you'll ever, ever be. <laughs> Believe me, the money will come. You'll get a lot more money when you start to work with people, and that means that you can do a lot more now with a lot less because you just you don't have expenses the way you will very very soon, and you're not tied down. That means you you don't have a mortgage. You don't have. I doubt very many of you are married. And if you don't have a spouse to keep, take care of or have to give you their opinion, and you don't have kids, <laughs> that is the number one reason that people don't start things later. That they've got a family to take care of, and you have other people in your lives that you need to pay attention to. You also have the support of the university, which is something you we did not we did not appreciate when we were here. But professors here, when you're out in the working world, you have to pay them like three hundred dollars an hour for their time. And you have it for free, and you have all of—I mean, you know all of these entrepreneurial programs going on right now. All of this advice, all this energy, and smart people around you, and you have to take advantage of that because you will never have it again. Yeah, when I was when I was um, working on an idea, a patent patent idea, in photography, I engaged with a professor at Stanford to look at my work. And he charged me five thousand dollars for ten hours of his consulting work. And you guys have access to all those people right now for free. They're not going to charge you anything. There's a lot of expertise that you can gain for free now that will cost you thousands of dollars later. And then when, when I interview um, recent graduates for, for positions at my company, it, it amazes me. They bring all of their papers in, all their, all their studies and, and reports. And you do this all for free. I mean, you're a student. You don't get paid. I can't believe you don't get paid to do this. You have really good working habits. You're used to working for free, and when you're when you graduate, that will not happen. You will quickly realize you can get paid for that. And, <laughs> and so I would I would utilize that that mindset that you have. It's gonna be a lot of work. And then while you probably have, do not have very much experience, you're very opt optimistic and idealistic. You don't really know what's up, and that's gonna help you. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to, to believe me, it's going to change. Maybe not the day you graduate, but it's going to be the, the window is closing fast. All right, so we've established, right? Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about how we're going to do this. How you're going to do this. So one of the big questions a lot of people I've talked to who are kind of um, student entrepreneurs is, um, how do I come up with an idea? I don't have an idea. I don't know what kind of business to do. And um, Yes. Go ahead to the next slide. So, just to kind of set it up, this picture is um, a guy named Roy Sullivan, and he holds the world record for the 
most number of times struck by lightning. He was struck by lightning seven times in his life. And you may have seen it in a curious case of Benjamin Button, who is the, the guy that uh, Benjamin Button was talking about. And I was actually just looking this up and wanted to read you the last time he was struck by lightning. So, on Saturday morning, June 25th, 1977, Sullivan was fishing in a freshwater pool when he was struck the seventh time. The lightning hit the top of his head, singeing his hair, and traveled down, burning his chest and stomach. Sullivan turned to his car, and then another unexpected thing happened. A bear appeared and tried to steal trout from his fishing line. <laughs> <laughs> Sullivan had the strength and courage to strike the bear with a tree branch. He claimed that was the 22nd time he hit a bear with a stick. <laughs> so, the reason for the story is, it's a huge world, there's all kinds of crazy things that happen. There's this guy, Roy Sullivan. People win the Powerball lottery, you know, all the time. And you hear about stories in the news of entrepreneurship, like Facebook and so forth. And those are not the examples, in my opinion, as a student entrepreneur, you want to be looking at when you're thinking about starting a company. Those are the equivalent of getting struck by lightning seven times or <laughs> winning the Powerball lottery. There's some cases where that happens, but if, if you are in addition, it's hard enough to try to start a company and make it successful and manage people and deal with payroll and deal with growth issues, but you make it that much harder when you try to come up with an idea that's completely out of left field that no one has done. As a student entrepreneur who's trying to figure out just how to start a company in the first place, I think my, my opinion is when you're thinking about ideas, just keep it simple. Um, one of the reasons why we did a website company was having a website company is kind of like being a lawyer. There's plenty of demand out there. If you do a good job with it, you'll be successful. If you don't, you won't be successful. We had no question about whether web development or design is a valid business model. And I would say when you're thinking about ideas, don't get too crazy with it. Think about simple things like you know, starting a restaurant, starting a coffee shop, starting a, some kind of service, you know, uh, lawn care service, starting you know, just something that you're very familiar with, you think you can do. Once you get into it, you will realize how to beat your competitors, how to do marketing, how to manage people, how to find an interesting angle in that business. Maybe you'll do it for a while and realize there's a software, you know, a piece of software that you could write that would be helpful to serve that industry or something like that. So I really would urge you to just think very small, try to come up with an idea, try to learn the basics of a business. You can still have a very successful multi-million dollar business without trying to think of some something that nobody has ever thought of before, which most of, in most cases is actually a bad could be a bad business. I think it may not help you win the Duke Trust startup challenge. Thinking it's small. But I still think <laughs> I think it is a good long term strategy. Yeah. And if you um, if you don't have any ideas, you can get a job, go work at a company, um, part time while you're in school and you'll either work at that job and say, hey, I could do this, I've done this for six months, I can start my own version of this, or in doing that job, you'll run across a problem that people are running into at that job and see an opportunity. For me, it really took when I was working for Full 7 and we were doing, had to do a website where I was like, I could do this, and a bunch of stuff I came across while I was at Full 7. I was like, oh, we need to pick a name for the company? I could, I could be, I had to start a naming company, and wow, we paid the ad agency. $20,000 to come up with this horrible name, you know, I can do this. So anyway, um, that's kind of just some ideas on how you can start thinking about uh, your business. This is kind of, probably kind of controversial, but we really believe trying to get funding is probably a bad idea for your first company. And one reason is when we were doing Easy Central, um, we were focused on getting funding. And the odds are, as a student, you're probably not going to get funding. And so if you're business relies on, if your business plan relies on getting funding, then you'll probably never end up doing the business because you're not going to find somebody who's going to give you funding. Your idea depends on funding and therefore you'll never get past square one. And secondly, even if you do raise funding, there's some, some difficulties with raising funding that really greatly increase the likelihood that your business is going to crash and burn. And so my, my thought is, if you go up with an idea that needs funding, find another idea. It doesn't need funding. Um, just practical advice. I know that I'm probably discouraging maybe the one in a million person who would have started the next Facebook, but it's for the best because for most people, I think that's good advice. Try to find an idea that doesn't require funding. Um, 
focus on ideas that can see, succeed at a small level before they succeed at a large level. So, you know, if your idea is either going to be a billion dollar idea or it's not going to work, then my advice would be look at an idea that could be a five or ten person company and maybe then it could become a thousand person company. I mean, even some companies that have become very large, like Microsoft and Dell, I mean, Dell started as a guy in his dorm room building computers and selling them. That could succeed at a small level. And then it eventually grew and became a multi-billion dollar company. And Microsoft's initial business ideas were you know, really small software projects that could succeed on a small level. So um, I would really think about that as a latest test. Starting with the service business is really helpful if you want to find something that doesn't require funding. So like web design, for example. Service businesses tend to be able to get started with little or no capital. You're selling your own time, essentially. And they scale really well because um, you sell your own time. When you get busy enough and get enough work, you can bring somebody on, hire somebody, and then you know, continue to grow organically. Product business is very, very tough. I was able to start it without funding, but it was extremely difficult. And I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be until I really got into it. So I would really focus on starting with the service, and maybe eventually you can have enough revenue that you can get into a product after that. Um, it's okay if your first company is a smashing success. The first of all, worst case scenario, <coughs> if you start a company and it fails, it's going to still put you, I think, in a better position in the job market than if you take an internship or some other kind of job. You're going to understand business a lot better. I think the reason I got my first job was because I had started a company. When you start a company, you give yourself responsibilities that no one else is going to give you and probably shouldn't give you. But by doing that, you learn a lot. And so um, if you fail, that's not a big deal. It can roll into a different venture or you know, give you great, a great head start in the job market. <laughs> so then talking about money, um, you don't, so that's still an issue. You need to have some kind of money. So we're kind of written off funding, you know, in most cases. So, so what are you going to do about money? Um, since you, you don't really need, you probably don't need very much because your burn rate is very low. So that's really good. Uh, and if you have a service model, then you'll get paid along the way. So that's kind of why that's a, that's a good entry point if, if you have an idea that would work in a services business. Can you do it, you know, think about can you do it just with your computer? Can, can you, what are, what's the least amount of things you can do at the beginning to get, to get started? Can your parents, you know, continue to support your, your, your burn rate until you, you have enough momentum that you can, um, can you start to sell it? There's also the startup challenge, which is good, and there's probably other stuff like that, that that's out there that is supporting uh, small young companies. But I would just generally stay away from VC as long as you can. Also, um, another thing is if you're doing a technology company, a lot of people say, well, it'll be ad supported. They'll just sell advertising, and that will, you know, that, that will, that will, that's a good, good route. And I would just generally stay away from that, as you have seen with this recession, what has happened to ad supported models. And it's just the price of that is going way down. Anything else to add on that? Okay. Next thing is, so we've talked about your idea, we've talked about money, another thing is time. You've got plenty of that when we talk about that. So we'll move on. So this is a uh, picture of a mouse sitting on a cell phone. Um, I don't think we had any specific point here. I just think it's a funny picture. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing is clients and customers. How do you get those? And I think we've already answered that question. What do you guys think it's going to be? Service. That's right. Customer service. It's viral. It starts a viral engine. You have your customer, you do a great job for them, and they start telling other people. It really does work. But we have seen that firsthand of making that work. And opportunities just come to you. You do a good job. And I think that every ever since the first big break with AOL, a, a lot of other stuff has happened. Just opportunities just happen if you have a really good approach. If people like you more, they just remember you, they that things just happen for you. And it's not this rational decision-making process. By having great, great customer service and really caring, it really does come back around. I mean, a lot of, you have a lot of clients now that worked at AOL at one point, left, went to another company, and called you, so. Yeah, people are still calling me. Um, the, that's how I got Chase, Chase Bank. 
was someone from AOL who had never actually worked with me but had heard of me within AOL two years ago. And that's how I got that client, which is, um, and those are still, those opportunities are still coming at me because I did a good job at, at AOL in the beginning. So let's, so those are the big, the big four topics of main questions about how to start a company. Um, we probably want to, we want to also talk about some objections that you might have that might hold you back. It's too risky for me right now, especially with the economy. Does anyone have that? as an objection? Okay, well that's good. All right, one person, thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's, I think, I think a lot of, you know, probably, you guys have probably gotten over that since you're here, well, because you're here. A lot of people, a lot of recent grads, they, they think, well, you know, I, I want guaranteed success. I've, I've worked hard my whole life. I've been successful my whole life. And I don't want this to be my first failure. I don't want to get out, have this big thing, and just fall on my face. And, that's really the level of risk that people want to, they're they used to succeeding and they just don't want to fail. And they're, they're used to a very structured environment. And, and that's why this, this is very unstructured. It's, a little, it's very scary for, for young people when they don't really have a clear um, experience. And I would say that it will always, you will always have to be at risk for your first, first failure. And it will always be on the table. You can go be successful somewhere else, you, will, you still have that as a risk. And, and especially in the recession, this is the time to do it because. And when we started our company, that was 2001. There was a you know recession-ish thing going on at that point with .com. <laughs> that can be a great time to start a company because you're going to probably be the low-cost provider when you're coming out with very little experience, and people are possibly looking for new services or looking to change providers at that point. Also, the opportunity cost now is small because let's face it, you're probably not going to be able to get a job in the company anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if this is something people think about, but I know that when I was at Duke, I felt like I didn't. There's no entrepreneurship booth at the career fair. You know, start your own company booth, and uh, you know, it seemed like nobody was starting their own company. And there's actually a lot more people than you think that start companies. There's over 25 million. Um, small businesses in the U.S. and I think 99.7 percent of employers are small businesses. So Is there's a really lot of small companies out there. 99.7 percent of all employers are small businesses. They're all entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of small companies out there. I'm in an entrepreneurship group and there's one guy in my group whose business is called buybigtires.com and all he does is sell huge mining tires that are like $250,000 tires to <laughs> Foreign countries like you know places in Africa and Russia and so forth and so there's just lots of little niches out there and you don't become aware of them very well when you're at the university but they're out there. So you don't have any skills? Um, I don't. I, I think you actually probably do. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, but that's a common thing. Yeah. You know, talking to, for example, your younger siblings that want to start businesses, but they're like. I can't do anything. I don't know how to do anything. My sister is, she graduated from Duke in 2005, and when she was here, she had this, she kind of put together a business plan with one of her friends for a cafe. She wanted to get a cafe right between east and west. I think there was like a space sort of in between that she thought would be a great place for a cafe. So she's, and she has been, um, and she didn't, she just, she thought, she thought, I'm too young, I have my whole life ahead of me. And um, she's now 27 years old, and she's been working in New York at Bumble and Bumble, which is like a hair, um, hair place. And she still really, she's like wishes that she had done it, that she still really wants to do that cafe. And she knows a little bit more, but not really. She hasn't got gained any spe of cafe specific experience. And, and she has a lot more confidence in herself to actually make it work now that she's seen what it's like to be out there and what, how, um, how other people are really not that impressive, but there's not a ton of competition. And now that she feels like she she could do it, she it's, it's too late that she has an expensive apartment, she has lots of friends, and she just she's on this career, and she would have to give up a really stable job to go do this. And she still talks about doing it, but I I think it's it's probably not something she'll ever do, and that really makes me feel bad because it's it's really a myth that you you are inadequate compared to other people that have a lot more experience than you do. You are way smarter, 
you work way harder, and you just have a, you have really good habits compared to everyone out there. I've interviewed tons of people that they haven't learned a single thing since they graduated from, from college, and people just stop learning. And and I think that means they're they're getting some experience, but it's not really anything that you should you know think is a threat to you. And yeah, just by virtue of the fact that you are a Duke student, you have skills. I mean. She was a psychology major. I was a philosophy major at college. I mean, you can't complain about not having any relevant skills. I didn't have any relevant skills. <laughs> 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 Sometimes you just have to jump in and, and um, realize that you are very competent and you can do a good job. So I don't know how to write a business plan. Yeah, I think um, that was a big barrier for me when I was undergrad. I spent months on this business plan and kind of slaved over it. And I would say I didn't realize one of the business plan software was one of the sponsors of this program, but um, I would say it's not necessary. Don't let a business plan hold you back from starting a business. Don't spend months on a business plan. The business plan, we didn't have a business plan when we started novel projects. I don't think this has a business plan even now. Um, and it's something for you, it's something a great way to get your ideas out on paper, but don't let a business plan or funding be things that stop you from getting started. It's great if you do it, but don't don't let it become a barrier for you. <coughs> so how do I find funding? I was on this list. That's all right. That's not really a problem. Let's see. So the last one is, I don't know if I have what it takes. I would say that's similar to I don't have any skills. I think that, just think in your mind, you know, what, you, what it takes is you have to be smart, which you are, to work hard, which you can, and you have to um, expect to be successful, and you have to follow your goals. And I think the only thing that that is maybe a little bit less intuitive is that you have to be an advocate for yourself. That you have to put yourself first. You have to follow your goals. That you have to, being being an entrepreneur is really good for people who want control. They they are have that can do attitude, and they care about their own their themselves. And I think it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I think a lot of people feel that. It's um, that they have that they're 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 there to help the community and to kind of social entrepreneurship and and they're not really I don't know they're putting themselves last. Also, a lot of people expect that because of the structure of this, your structured life, you kind of expect people to kind of take care of you, lead the way, show you what to do next. You're, you're, you take classes and there's always an expert. Of filling your mind with what you need to know, and I think that by having that attitude of of taking care of yourself, that you're responsible for your own happiness and your own success, I think is a is a key attitude that does make a big, big difference. I didn't have great confidence, but I did always have that. In fact, a good example is when I was in high school. I really hated my physics teacher, and and I just thought I just thought she was terrible. I was it didn't help that I was getting an F. But um, <laughs> the thing is I got an A because she structured herself so badly that I was able to make up for all of those four tests with a bunch of extra credit, which she really shouldn't have given me the option to do that. And it was just a bad idea. And anyway, I tried to get her fired. And I, I got a, a petition and sent it around to have other students sign this petition to fire this woman. And no one would sign it. I didn't understand why no one else would sign my petition. That it wouldn't put their name on that. And, I think that that was a sign that I had that, you know, just, I just want to make that happen. And I expected that other people would want that too, because everyone was complaining about her, but no one would actually sign it. And so I think that's a, a key thing that, that, that has helped me since then. Here are some two great books. Two great, reading is really important. Um, there's no classes for entrepreneurship after you graduate, just like to read, to continue to get um, advice. These ones are the two ones that have made the biggest impact for, for me. Uh, they're great books, and I would definitely get them and read them. And I would read them multiple times because you'll see different things in them as your company matures. So, um, kind of, the way I'd like to end it is there's this joke about um, an entrepreneur and an economist walking down the street, and an entrepreneur says, Hey, it's, look, it looks like a $100 bill on the sidewalk. Um, should I I pick that up and the economist says, uh, no, don't waste your energy. If it was a real $100 bill, somebody else would have already picked it up by now. And um, I guess too much money.
kind of pick Peter. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of that attitude um, in academia and or in undergrad, and also probably a lot of people you know, kind of like the idea that, you know, shooting down your idea that, you know, why couldn't somebody else do that? If it was a good idea, somebody else would have already done it. And I think what I found going out into the real world is the economy is not nearly as efficient as people like to make it out in business school or in undergrad classes. There's a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of hundred dollar bills on the sidewalk for you to pick up and you just kind of need to have that attitude and have that confidence that there are opportunities out there. My idea can work. Don't let people tell you it can't work unless they really know what they're talking about and they're entrepreneurs like us. But uh, you know, have confidence in yourself. Believe that you can succeed. And we just kind of wanted to leave you with one of the five five points here. Um, one, you should be an entrepreneur. You should try it. There's nothing to lose. You should start it now. Keep your idea simple. Don't try to create the next Facebook. Get customer service right. And then last idea is if you do happen to start a company, you should consider uh, the possibility of giving a percentage of, of your revenue to the person who admits you to start a company. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we've got. And, um, Raise your hand, anyone in here, here who has already started a company or is planning on starting a company this semester? Okay. Um, how about you? What's, what's your name? Me? Mm -hmm. When? Have when you started a company? Or are you no, yeah, I've had. What do you have? Do you have an idea? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's the idea? It's uh, e business. E business? Yeah, boss service. Uh, okay. And what's one takeaway that you've had from this presentation today? Um, Turn on and uh, keep your idea simple. Okay. <laughs> 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 We've actually got a real, a real hundred dollar bill here, and so here's your, your seed funding to start with. <laughs> 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 Couple questions. Two. Yeah. <coughs> um, about I guess, your, the structure of your company and kind of the role of all. Uh, obviously, when you start out, you've got you know, one to four people, maybe, and everyone's doing everything. Um, and as you grow, like, it's supposed to be about 20 people now. Um, how do you see your role changing? When do you when do you decide that? Uh, it's important to maybe not micromanage and not be involved in you know, the, the nitpicky details of every project and kind of just be the overseer. I think that's a great question. And it's, it's, there's always a hard answer to that. It's different for, for everybody. It's, it's uh, for us, for me, it was, um, it took me a while to do that. I think it would, once I used to find my core values, it accelerated. Uh, I did every role in the company. I started so Brooks, as a designer. Could you repeat the question? I don't think some oh, people sorry. in the back of it. About his question about changing roles, how when did we choose in our um, in development of our company when when we saw Mark micromanaging, we saw how we learn to delegate and what's the structure around that? Is that is that right? Okay. When uh, when I um, I sit I started in the design and then there was too much design I, Moved into the account the account management. I managed the designers, and then I grew. Then I was starting to manage the account manager. I had a designer, and then I was training her to be account manager. And then when I was ready, she was ready. I felt she was ready. Then she became the account manager. So moving up that way until a certain point when I was, I now had six designers, three account managers, and an office manager, and all these people, and I think 14 people, and I was still managing them all. And I wasn't managing individual accounts as much, but I was still doing invoicing and a bunch of stuff. And that's when it was too much. I, that model broke, and I was ground, ground, drowning. And I made that was I made. We were losing money, and it was, it was a very tough decision. But I decided to go ahead and invest five hundred thousand dollars in additional salaries and buy um, three uh, executives: uh, a creative director, a client services director, and a VP of Finance and operations. All those guys make over $100,000 by a lot. And 
very talented, very experienced, great team. And then I moved into the new business, and which is kind of the place where I really should be. And uh, ever since I did that, it's been huge. It's a huge positive change in the, in the company. And since then, we've been making money. But um, it was a very scary thing to do. So it's always scary to do that. But it's very <coughs> important. Yeah, and my kind of theory is it takes it takes about 20% of the effort of doing a task to delegate it. So if you're managing more than about five people, then you're probably not able to properly delegate tasks to the company. And so I think Brooks has three or four executive team members, and I've got I have four people that I directly manage now. And um, so I kind of learned that the hard way. Eventually, it's not a choice anymore. Things get big enough where you just can't do everything, and you have to. It'll happen on its own no matter what. But that's the way that I look at it. Is I don't like to have any one of anyone in my company managing more than five people. Another question? Yeah, when, when you were first getting started, uh, I know that you mentioned, I think both of you, that parents sometimes push business your way. But those first couple projects, how were you able to land the clients without um, kind of a history of something you could show them that this is the quality of our work? You know what I mean? How did you get them to take a risk on you? first client was that worked at Honors in Lake Lane, and we were able to kind of get that on the strength of the project that we did for free um, for Bruce's mom. And one thing that we didn't put in the presentation, but, you know, you have plenty of time. I would urge you to think outside the box. If you can't get anyone to pay for some, pay for a project, just do a project for free for somebody, and then they'll become a reference customer. When you send that, give that portfolio to other people, you don't need to let them know that they'll, they'll never know that that person didn't pay. Sometimes free will be too expensive for some clients as well. But uh, just get out there and get work. We got this one client, Blake Lane, from this orthodontic uh, site we did. Next site we got was from my mom's company. And other ones were just people we knew that kind of gave us small projects and just kind of built from there. The, the first one, real one was the one where we were so hungry for it that he was the one that told us to stop, stop uh, doing free things for him. Yeah, it was a retainer yeah. project that was going to be two or three thousand dollars a month recurring revenue, and we just got the opportunity from actually he was speaking at Duke at Duke Entrepreneurship class, and I Brooks cornered him and um, got lunch with him, and we just pursued it and made sure we didn't lose the job. All right, well let's give another round of applause.